I'm Eric Schultzka. Join Constant Wonder on a quest to find awe and wonder in nature and human nature in worlds vast and small, a podcast in search of all that moves us. Humans are connectors. Our lives are built around friends, family, lovers, spouses, neighbors, colleagues. We reach across cultures and continents. We seek common values of beauty and compassion. We even reach into space. When NASA sent out two Voyager missions in 1977, each of them carried a golden phonograph to introduce Earth's people to aliens. Then we reach back in time, we search our own roots. We get chills when we see Paleolithic cave paintings in France or 30,000-year-old handprints in Spain or Argentina. Behind each such artifact, there's a human being and a human story, and the artifact lets us almost touch the person. I've come to think that the romance of archaeology rests on this sense of human commonality that bridges the eons of time, Consider the iconic fictional archaeologist Indiana Jones. Jones is, of course, over the top. Most archaeologists will never experience the supernatural. They're not in movies. Fieldwork is hot, dry, and dusty, involving endless hours crouching with brushes and filtering heaven knows what. But then there are those moments when suddenly a city or a language and a people spring from the dust. One archaeologist calls this feeling mind touch. There's nothing that beats the moment of discovery, real new knowledge that nobody knows about, something that nobody has seen before. And it's happened to me a number of times in my life. And, you know, in those moments, your mind just goes tumbling back over the centuries. And you do make mind touch with the people of that era. And it's such a special magical, electric moment. It's very, very hard to explain. That's retired Oxford University marine archaeologist Menson Bound. As a professor, he spent his summers finding lost ships. He's one of those rare people whose career has been built around the awe we feel when we touch an item last touched by anonymous human hands millennia ago. I just can't explain what you feel. As as an archaeologist, you're supposed to be able to exercise a certain amount of, let's say, professional detachment between you and the object of your study. But at that moment, (laughs) forget it. This is a man who found a Roman wreck with Greek pillars and statues that sank off the coast of Tunisia. He found a 2,500-year-old Etruscan shipwreck off the coast of Italy, not to mention iconic German warships from World War I and World War II, and even Lord Horatio Nelson's flagship from the 1805 Battle of Trafalgar. Given all of these, you might be surprised to know that Mensen Bound's biggest find is a ship that sank barely a century ago. Its name, the Endurance. On March 5th, 2022, Precisely 100 years to the day after Ernest Shackleton's burial on South Georgia Island, Bound and his team discovered this vessel, still mostly intact, at the bottom of an ice-bound Weddell Sea off the coast of Antarctica. He's written about the discovery in his latest book, The Ship Beneath the Ice, The Discovery of Shackleton's Endurance. To understand why finding Shackleton's endurance was so important, we need to know more about Shackleton, but also we need to know a little more about Menson Bound himself. Let's start with Shackleton. In August of 1914, just as World War I was breaking out in Europe, Ernest Shackleton sailed with 27 other men and about 70 dog sled dogs into the Antarctic's Weddell Sea. They were aboard the Norwegian-built wooden ship, the Endurance which previously had been known as the Polar Star. They renamed it uh, appropriately. Their goal was to become the first team to traverse the width of the Antarctic continent. The Endurance was a remarkably sturdy ship, but the ice proved to be impassable and unforgiving. The ship was first caught and held by the ice, and they actually uh, were out on the ice for quite some time and took some remarkable photographs that survived from uh, the, the time when the ship was uh, on the verge of being crushed. But then the ship was crushed and slid beneath the ice to sink on the bottom. The men were left adrift, 
dragging the lifeboats across this nearly impossibly jagged sea ice, and then when the ice broke up, sailing those boats through dangerous, stormy waters. The world, which was occupied with the historic bloodletting of World War I, paid little attention to the men's fate until, nearly two years later, when all 28 of the crew emerged from the ice not only alive, but doing very well, minus a few toes. Shackleton's tale of escape and rescue has acquired the status of legend. Students of history and leadership still marvel at Shackleton's accomplishment, the foresight to bring the right supplies out from the doomed ship before it slipped beneath the ice. History has also noted the crew's skill in finding a refuge on Elephant Island, in sheltering in dugouts underneath overturned lifeboats, and then feeding themselves on penguins and sea elephants and seaweed through one and a half polar winters. Then there was the uncanny seamanship of Shackleton and the ship's captain, Frank Worsley, in piloting a total of five men in a tiny lifeboat through a hurricane using dead reckoning in the world's stormiest sea. That feat was then followed by the raw grit to scale and descend an icy unmapped glacial mountain range in search of a forlorn whaling station. The climbers finished that chapter of the adventure by literally sledding on their backs down a mountainside for much of the final distance to the whaling camp. Having found the whaling camp on South Georgia Island in the remote South Atlantic, Shackleton then had to get his remaining 22 men off of Elephant Island. That rescue became an epic in its own right. Minson Bound picks up the story here of Shackleton's multiple efforts to save his crew. There were four attempts to rescue his men on Elephant Island. The first attempt was indeed from South Georgia. He took a whaling ship called the Southern Sky from Leith, as I recall, and they couldn't get through the ice to Elephant Island. So rather than go back to South Georgia, they headed instead to the Falkland Islands because they had a radio in the Falklands and he could radio for help. So then he got to the Falklands and with the governor's help, he got some assistance from Montevideo, Uruguay, a thousand nautical miles to the north. And they sent a fishing boat down with the wonderful name of Instituto de Pesca Numero Uno. And they made another attempt from the Falklands using that fishing boat. And again, they couldn't get through. So they came back to the Falklands, and then Shackleton heard about an old whaling schooner, a ship that was 80 years old, made of wood, in Punta Arenas in the Straits of Magellan. So he crossed to the Straits of Magellan, took this ship, which was called the Emma, and made another attempt to rescue his men. Again, he couldn't get through. And then while heading back to Chile, to Punta Arenas, he ran into a storm, and rather than try and fight the storm, he cut a slant again for the Falkland Islands. So he came to the Falklands for the third time. And then the Chilean government came to his rescue and lent him a naval tugboat called the Gelcho. And with that boat, on his fourth attempt, he succeeded in getting through and rescuing the men. 30th of August, 1916. So finally, after 18 months on the ice, the complete Shackleton team emerged, all 28 men, leaving behind as human casualties only five frostbitten toes off of one otherwise healthy human foot. But Shackleton's men did leave one lady behind. By tradition in the English tongue, ships are considered female, and it was she, the beloved Endurance, who was left behind in the Weddell Sea off the coast of Antarctica, never to return home. For generations, the mysteries of her loss and her position and her condition have haunted scholars and fans of the Shackleton story. This tangible symbol of human courage and leadership had vanished beneath the ice. Endurance had become a hidden relic. Relocating her would seem like the final act or perhaps the proper epilogue to this powerful moment in history. So this hour we'll be learning how a modern crew has written a dramatic epilogue to the Shackleton story. Millions of dollars, hundreds of people, that's what it took to find endurance at the bottom of the Weddell Sea. Not to mention an enormous South African icebreaker ship, two helicopters, cutting-edge submersible robots, an engineering crew with equipment to drill in case they needed to if they couldn't break the ice with the ship, 
It turned out to be a multi-year effort that failed once in 2019 and nearly failed again in 2022. But then just about a day before they would have had to leave because the weather was closing in and because the lease on their ship had expired, on March 5th, 2022, a year ago this week, they found the endurance. But before we get to that epilogue, let's get to know the modern day protagonist who helped write it. Minson Bound was born and bred with a passion for the Shackleton story, for the sea itself, and for the craft of underwater archeology. span He developed this passion just simply by virtue of being raised in the remote Falkland Islands deep in the South Atlantic. A great, great uncle of Menson's, a man named Vincent Biggs, actually hosted Ernest Shackleton at a pub the family owned while Shackleton was in the Falklands putting together his rescue expedition for his men stuck on the island. I was pretty much weaned on the Shackleton story. My father was something of a fan. But interestingly, when he was in the Falklands trying to rescue his men on Elephant Island, he actually stayed for a while with my family. My family on my mother's side ran a kind of a bedding establishment. It was a pub that didn't have the best of reputations, I'm told. It was called The First and Last. And the visitor's book for The First and Last still survives. And Shackleton's name is still there, along with Tom Crean and and the captain of, of the Endurance, a man called Worsley. But when I was very young, I was given a book about Shackleton, a kid's book. I would have been about I guess, nine at the time. It was it would have been about 1959, I'm guessing. I was giving a prize book at the church for Sunday school attendance, and I actually read it. And that got me into the Shackleton story. So after that, I was, you know, like many people in the Falklands, a Shackleton fanatic. And it just went on from there. Of course, I never realized that at the end of my life, I would be part of a team looking for Shackleton's ship. We'll let Menson take the story from here, but sit down and buckle up because even before Menson Bound became a real life aquatic counterpart to the fictional Indiana Jones, his real life was already pretty improbable. I was born and brought up in the Falklands, but then age 12, I was sent to school in Montevideo in Uruguay in the River Plate. So I spent six years of my life living in Uruguay. After that, I went back to the Falklands, but, you know, we're talking the late 60s. I mean, times were hard. There wasn't a lot of money around. I couldn't get work. And I'd always wanted to go to sea. And I heard about this ship called the RMS Darwin, who just lost some people in Montevideo. And I telegrammed the skipper and said, please give me a job. I heard you've lost some of the crew, some of the people in the engine room. I'll do anything. And he telegrammed back saying, yes, there's a position in the Stokehold in the engine room. And I grabbed that. And then I stayed with the ship for, I don't know, approaching two years. I guess it must have been. I was set for a career on the oceans, and I was very happy with that. And then when they sold the ship, I had the option of going with the ship to Greece or leaving the ship in the Falklands. But we were on a passage to South America. So I jumped ship in Punta Arenas. You may recall that when Shackleton was rescuing his men, he dropped in on the Falklands a few times. But he also made a foray to Chile, a place called Punta Arenas, roughly 500 miles west of the Falklands. That's where he got the tugboat that saved his men. So here's a young Menson bound in that same port, about to do what exactly? Menson, when you said that you jump ship, did you really mean that you were literally going AWOL, or is that just a, an expression? for saying goodbye. No, no. I mean, I jumped ship. But I felt at that point, because they deliberately not told us about selling the ship until they had everybody at sea, so there's nothing we could do about it, I thought, well, okay, I really don't owe you anything after that one. The first night in Punta Arenas, I couldn't get out of the docks because they have big dock gates there. So I spent the night in a warehouse. I climbed up all these sacks of grain, and I'm trying to sleep on top of this grain, and I'm right up near the rafters, of the warehouse. And then I wake up, I don't know what time it was, midnight after midnight, with this this funny little scratching noise going on. 
And I turned on the torch I had, and on the rafters, running round beside my ears, were all these rats, and their eyes kind of lit up in the torch. And I, I just sat there all night. I didn't dare sleep after that until they opened the dock gates the next morning. And then as all the Stevie doors and longshoremen were coming in, I sort of wriggled my way out. And for the next eight months, I hitchhiked all the way to New York with the idea in mind of going to university because I'd been accepted to a number of American universities. Because of course he did. He jumped ship in the Straits of Magellan in Chile on the southern tip of South America, hitchhikes across two continents, all the way to New York City. Why New York City? When I was a kid growing up in the Falklands, everybody used to listen to the BBC overseas service. But I, for some reason, always used to listen to the Voice of America. I'd always wanted to go to New York City. My family didn't have anywhere near enough money to pay for American university fees. But I had this notion that if somehow I got to New York, something would happen. And indeed it did. I got to New York City and I went to one of the universities that had accepted me. And they were not very helpful because I couldn't pay the bills. But I was told about an American scholarship foundation called the Leopold Shep Foundation on 551 Fifth Avenue. And believe it or not, I actually went and knocked on their door and asked for a scholarship. I was so innocent. I said, look, I've been hitchhiking for eight months to get to New York to go to university. Please, please give me a scholarship. And the secretary of the foundation who opened the door, a lovely lady, I later got to know her from Princeton, New Jersey. She explained to me that there was a process that you had to apply and things like that. Standing behind her was one of the trustees. I didn't know that at the time. He's just working on the Xerox machine there. And as she was closing the door on me, he said, wait a moment. Gumption, chutzpah, Luck, making your own luck, call it what you will. I like the odds of a young man who hitchhikes the length of two continents and then rings a doorbell on Fifth Avenue in New York City. He said, come on in. I was listening to your story. And he took me through to one of the offices, gave me a cup of coffee. And I talked to him about my dream of going to university in the States. And he said, I tell you what I'll do. I'll call up a majority of the trustees and I'll see if I can help. And he left me. And half an hour later, he came back into the room and said, this is what we can do. So they gave him a scholarship to a college in New Jersey, where he did well enough to graduate and well enough to move on to Oxford University in England to study archaeology. It was while he was at Oxford studying to hone his craft as a marine archaeologist that he had the opportunity to work on one of the great shipwreck discoveries of that day. I was working on the Mary Rose, Henry VIII's great fighting ship, which sank in battle off the Solent, off the south of England. And I was working on her as a student volunteer, along with my then girlfriend, now my wonderful wife, Joanna. And we met the man who found the wreck of the Mary Rose. And he was a writer by profession. And one day we went to meet him at his house. And in the course of that discussion, he took me into his writer's studio and it was a small room, which is completely booked on all sides. But the top shelf up near the ceiling, uh, there were no books, just little bits and pieces of things he'd found in a career underwater as a diver, just bits and pieces of broken amphora, mementos, things like that, that meant nothing to anybody except to him. But there was one piece there that caught my eye. And so I said to him, where did that piece come from? And he paused and he said, Menson, of all the pieces up there, why did you select that one? I told him that it was Etruscan. I told him that it dated to more or less 600 BC. I said that I could see that it came from an underwater context because it was covered in marine deposits. And I said that if that came from a shipwreck, that would make it the oldest post-Bronze Age ship ever to be discovered. And therefore, it would be of potentially outstanding archaeological significance. And then he proceeded to tell me this incredible story about how 20 years before, he'd been on this tiny island called Giglio, which is off the coast of Tuscany, North Italy. And he'd been there at a dive school belonging to a man called Reg Valentine. And he's told me the story about how Reg found this wreck off an offshore reef and he said it was one of the most remarkable sights he had ever seen. And he said to me, well, well, if you want to know more about this wreck, you'll have to meet Reg Valentine. 
So I went to meet Reg Valentine at his house in London, and I spent about an hour talking to him, telling him I was a student archaeologist at Oxford, and I'd seen this piece in, down at the Mary Rose. And he was very suspicious at first in the way that divers are. You know, if they find wrecks, they tend to keep them close to their chests. But then he went upstairs and he came down with about four or five old photographs, just snapshots taken in 1961 uh, on the boat he was using at that time. And it just showed divers sitting around on the boat, holding bits and pieces of pottery, a bit like trophies. At that moment, I knew that I'd blundered into something of outstanding archaeological importance. And it all went from there. And I spent the next four years of my life, the next four summers, working with my wife on this tiny little island, excavating this incredible shipwreck. And these days, if you want to see the material from the Giglio ship, then you go to the National Underwater Museum of Italy, which is in a place called Porto Santo Stefano, and the entire top floor is nothing but artifacts from the Giglio ship. So there I was, a student, not yet 30, I don't think, with this incredible find. It was the, I was told later, it was the biggest excavation going in Europe. And more than that, I had an exhibition in Florence, which lasted almost an entire year. Uh, you know, it never happens to most archaeologists in their career. And yet there I was still a student and I had an exhibition in Florence. I'm Eric Schultzka, and this is Constant Wonder. Our guest is Menson Bound, a marine archaeologist and the author of The Ship Beneath the Ice, The Discovery of Shackleton's Endurance. So here's a young Menson Bound, not yet 30, still a graduate student, and now he's leading the excavation on one of the world's oldest major shipwrecks. And he has one of his first experiences with that surge of energy, mind touch as he calls it, that profound sense of leaping across time, maybe closing the gap altogether, if only for an instant. I imagine it as an unforgettable, meaningful moment of connecting to peoples of the past. He's about to take us to the scene off that reef where he's diving with a photographer, surveying shipwreckage on the sandy sea floor, all the while trying to stay out of the way of the photographer's camera. I moved over to one side so as not to stir up any dust to obscure his photographs. And I was just idly putting my fingers in the sand. And all of a sudden, I was looking down on this little pot called an Arabalos. And the decoration on the pot was of two combating warriors. And straight away, I recognized the hand of the artist who'd done that work. That's not to say I knew him by name or anything like that. I didn't. But I knew him by his work, by his oeuvre. When it happens, it's like being touched by a cattle prod. I, I'm not saying it's the same for all archaeologists. But to me, when I'm working on ancient shipwrecks or other shipwrecks, and you have moments like that, which puts you in contact with an individual. I never feel that these people are, so to speak, fossils or anything like that at all. They are living, breathing people with whom I share a common humanity. So when I found that man's work and I recognized his work on the seabed 50 meters down, there was this sudden explosion of euphoria, undiluted joy in my head. And that, to me, was probably one of the most, I don't know, electrifying moments ever. It certainly comes close to matching the moment when we found the endurance. Now, rest assured that we're going to come back to the discovery of Shackleton's endurance in a moment. But before we do, I want to share one more mind touch with you, with Menson Bound, and with the seafaring humans of the past that Menson has, un I was going to say unearthed, but unwatered. This discovery takes place in the Mediterranean Sea in the early 1990s, about 10 years after his work on the Gilio ship. We're going down to the tip of Africa, off the coast of Tunisia, where Menson Bound, who is now a professor at Oxford, is looking for an ancient Roman ship that sank there right about 86 BC in a storm, dragged to the bottom with a ballast of stolen loot. We were looking for a vessel called the Madia ship. It had been found at the turn of the century by sponge divers, and it was full of architectural pieces, statuary, fine art, pottery, everything which was just 
beautiful. So it was found by sponge divers. And then a French archaeologist called Merlin, he excavated during the early years of the century. And then for a long time, it was lost. And then Jacques Cousteau found it again, which would have been the 50s. And then it was lost again. You know, these days we take GPS for granted, so it seems strange that you could find a wreck and then lose it. The French archaeologists in 1907 had carefully described how to find the site using landmarks on the shore. But the shore was distant and hazy, and the landmarks themselves had disappeared. So now we have a wreck twice found and twice lost, and Mensenbound is accepting the challenge of a third discovery. I had no real coordinates to work from at all. Uh, the only indicators I had were transits, which said if you line up, I remember one of them was if you line up a rock on the beach with a copse of trees, that was one of your transits. Well, of course, the beach is full of rocks and, you know, a copse of trees from 40 years ago. I mean, it just wasn't there. We were diving and diving blind. We really had very little to go on. In the end, we had one bearing and that was it. And even that wasn't very reliable. And of course, the further you get away from the shore, the less reliable that bearing becomes. We, we had a rough distance. I think it was Cousteau who left us. Uh, I, I forget what, what the distance was. So we had a rough distance. So then it was, it really was, you know, sort of like the proverbial needle in the haystack. Uh, and roughly when we were over, over, over that distance from the shore, we just jumped in the water. We took turns. We had with us aqua scooters. It turns out that aqua scooters are just what they sound like. They're small, submersible engines with handles that pull a diver through the water. I have to say they look like fun. They really aren't high-tech, though. And in later years, marine archaeologists would come up with systems to find the objects on the bottom using multiple submersibles that could be done in a crisscross pattern using a preset grid and guided by coordinates. Bound calls this more modern approach mowing the lawn. Well, no one was mowing the lawn in the 1990s. You just jumped in the water with an aqua scooter and went for it. We just hope we got lucky, and in the end, we did. One of the divers in the aqua scooter spotted one of the columns. It was just an incredible, incredible sight. And we spent two seasons working on that. And there was a huge exhibition in Germany as a result of our work. In 86 BC, the Roman general and dictator Sola had it sacked and burned Athens after the Greeks had rebelled against Roman imperial rule. Much of Athens was destroyed. The Romans looted art and cultural artifacts, the idea being to ship them back to Rome. One ship was overloaded with 66 massive marble columns, and it appears to have been caught in a storm, driven past Sicily, all the way to the tip of Africa, where it sank. The question is, what were they doing off Tunisia? And the only explanation can be that they were heading for Rome and the ship simply just, just got blown southward. You can imagine the ship would have been handling like a dog. I mean, she only probably had one large square sail anyway. So, I mean, you've got a piece of lead in the water. There's not much you can do with it except turn and run before the storm. And if the storm is coming from the north, that means you went south. Uh, the fact is we found her quite a distance away from the shore. Or you could see the shore with just this little ribbon on the horizon, but there were no obvious reefs or anything like that anywhere nearby at all. So therefore, she must have been overwhelmed by that storm. That's the only explanation I can think of for why she was there, where she was. And it all came from one wreck. Here's an irony to consider. If those 66 marble columns that sank the ship were taken from the Temple of Zeus in Athens, as is widely thought. You might say that the sky and thunder god got his revenge on the Romans here off the coast of Tunisia. So now that we know Mensen bound a little better, it's time to go find endurance. Now you wouldn't think that an expedition of this magnitude one that is going to cost millions, require a cast of hundreds, icebreakers, helicopters, submersibles. You wouldn't think that a project like that would take shape in a coffee shop and that it would emerge as a sort of consolation prize. The story of the Shackleton expedition, or two expeditions, goes back uh, 10 years last August. 
I was meeting with a friend of mine in a coffee bar in London, the old Brompton Road in South Kensington. And we were meeting to discuss shipwrecks, what else? Uh, we were going to talk about a ship called the Terra Nova, which had been used by Captain Scott on his expedition to Antarctica, his great uh, voyage of no return. You remember the story, um, Scott was competing with Amundsen, the Norwegian, to get to the South Pole. They both made it, but Amundsen got there first, and Scott died on the way back. So I'd been asked by the Natural History Museum in London if I could find his ship, the Terra Nova, because it was the centenary of Scott's death. And I happened to have a really good set of coordinates for her. And I said that, give me six days and the right equipment, I will find the Terra Nova, I promise you. And so we were meeting to discuss that. And as my friend was holding the table, I was over at the counter buying the coffee. And I was flipping through that day's complimentary copy of the Times. And on page seven, there was an article. And I'll never forget it. The article was headed, Terra Nova Found. And of course, I was absolutely devastated. So my friend asked me what was wrong. And I told him, I showed him the article. And he sort of looked at it, scratched his head and tugged on his chin. And he said, well, what about the endurance? And that, that was the moment of inception. That's when the project began. We're going to compress the story a little bit here. The Endurance Project was conceived in that coffee shop in 2012. In 2019, they finally got around to making the first effort to go find the Endurance. That effort was plagued by equipment failures and some really bad weather. Those are the risks of the trade, and when your trade takes you to hostile polar climes, those are the same risks faced by Shackleton himself. So when Bound's crew returned from that failed expedition in the spring of 2019, there was no certainty that they would ever be back. So the first expedition to find the Endurance had ended in complete failure. We lost our search vehicle. The ice closed on us. The weather came down on us, and everything just went terribly wrong. And we had to get out of the pack quickly because otherwise we would have been frozen in there for the, for the rest of the season. Bound was never one to be idle, so after the failure in 2019, he kept himself busy running a successful expedition to find a World War I German ship named the Scharnhorst that had gone down in battle against the English in 1914 off the coast of the Falklands. Interestingly enough, it was also right around the same time that Shackleton's men were going into the ice. And he actually found the Scharnhorst in December of 2019. He then rode out COVID in his home in the Falklands while planning his next attempt on Shackleton's ship. It was his wife who encouraged him to get writing a book, and it was also her suggestion to use original diary entries from the expedition as a metronome for his own account. So I was there in our house on the waterfront in Port Stanley by myself a week after week after week, wondering how I can make this time kind of work for me. And it was her idea to start writing a book about the first attempt to find the ship. And her advice to me was, uh, whatever I did, keep it in the moment and bring it back to Shackleton. Whatever you're writing about, bring it back to Shackleton. And that's what I tried very hard to do. Fortunately, I had all the Shackleton diaries with me, so I had plenty of mining ground there. Three years later, refitted and with fresh hopes, the 22 expedition to find Endurance launched from Cape Town, South Africa. They were based on a massive South African icebreaker, and I say based because it might as well have been an island in its own right. The ship carried cutting-edge sonar robots called Sabertooths, two helicopters, one to transport men and another to transport equipment, including drilling equipment and housing and food. They had to set up in case a team of engineers was needed to go drill out across the ice in case the ship wasn't able to create space on its own. In the event, the ship actually was able to create that space, but this was a massive undertaking. Sailing is a famously slow way to get somewhere. Endless seascapes alternating with dark skies, long stretches of time that lend themselves to deep thinking. I have spent a lot of my life 
on the bridge of many ships over many parts of the world. And to me, it's one of the most spiritual places ever. And especially at nighttime, when you dim the lights, because if you don't dim the lights, you get this kind of reflection on the glass, and you've always got to be absolutely alert in case there's something in the water ahead of you. So you always dim the lights on the bridge. And it's this quiet moment where you might be there with the skipper or with the mate or whoever's on duty, plus the cadets, plus the bosun, something like that. And nobody says very much. Often there's music playing in the background quietly, but it's it's a very quiet, introspective, contemplative time. And I always think that I, I experienced a, what you might call a bad attack of agnostics when I was in my teens, which I never quite got over. But I do know this, that if ever I do find a pathway to God, it will be on the bridge of a ship at night. While we were in Antarctica, guess what happened? Russia invaded Ukraine. I've never seen a ship react as one in the way that did that day when we heard on our telephones and on our radio that Ukraine had just been invaded by Russia. It was depressing beyond words that that could have happened you know, in our century. I thought we'd gone beyond that, but no, it happened. And so this terrible invasion by Putin took everybody back to what had happened in World War I when Shackleton was was active in Antarctica. If you remember, he set off from London on the 1st of August, 1914. And three days later, we have the the guns of August. And he's off Kent, and war is declared. And he sends a telegram through to the First Lord of the, First Lord of the Admiralty, a man called Winston Churchill, none other, uh, offering the services of his ship and his men to the nation. And Churchill, within an hour, fired back to Shackleton, a one-word telegram, and that one word was proceed. So they left for Antarctica feeling kind of guilty. Um, Some of the diarists wrote about this feeling quite eloquently, how they wondered how they'd be welcomed back to England afterwards, having escaped the war as they did. So it was always on their mind what was happening in Europe. Uh, They didn't have any radio link at all to the rest of the world. So all they could do was speculate. And they did endlessly. They're always talking about the war. You know, uh, it, it was for us that connection was made. Noting this echo from history, the crew of the 2022 expedition headed on into the Weddell Sea, the ice pack, in search of the elusive endurance. At first, things didn't seem to be going much better than they did in 2019. On February 20th, there was an initial moment of false euphoria. They found a little debris from the ship, and they thought they had found the whole thing. They were wrong. Newspapers at home began second-guessing their strategy, a problem Shackleton never had to deal with. Things were looking dire. They were literally running out of time. The winter was coming on, the Antarctic winter, and their lease on the ship was about to expire. They weren't even really sure if they were searching the right coordinates with the highest probability. Because remember, the weather conditions during the Shackleton expedition had made the placement of the ship where it went down a little uncertain. We had come through a period of really terrible, terrible weather. The ice was getting aggressive. It was snarling around us. The pressure was building. We felt like, you know, we were within the coils of a boa constrictor or something like that. And the weather had just become, well, become dangerous. The temperatures had dropped to minus 45 degrees centigrade, not Fahrenheit, centigrade. So, you know, the wind chill was taking it down to minus 50, and that is seriously dangerous stuff. It popped the fillings in my teeth. We had guys on board whose eyelids were frozen closed. It was that dangerous. We had a team just looking after the guys on the back deck to make sure nobody got frostbite or anything like that. The ship was struggling. There was no doubt about it. The captain had said, we can't go on much longer. You know, we're into the end game. And, you know, our backs were right up against the Antarctic winter. There are no other ships anywhere around us at all in the Weddell Sea who could come to help us. The big freeze was about to begin. We were all terrified about getting caught in the ice, (laughs) like the endurance, I suppose. I thought, okay, this is it. You know, it's back 
back to England, back to South Africa, beaten twice. And I knew that my career would be over because nobody gives anybody, you know, a third chance in maritime archaeology. And yet even in the midst of this crisis, ice was literally closing in on the ship. The expedition's fortune was in grave doubt. And for all of this, in spite of it, still there were moments of unearthly awe and beauty that would burst out. And again, these moments seem to closely parallel the diaries that Mensum Bound was reading from Shackleton's men kept a century before. There were moments there where things which the diarists describe were exactly what we were experiencing. I remember when we had that incredible, like it was like an Indian summer. And I do remember on the day we had that incredible breakthrough when we came out of the really bad weather and suddenly it was warm. We had brilliant visibility. The sun was out. And I looked in the diarist, several of them, to see what they had to say. And on that very same day, back in uh, 1915, the, the diarists were experiencing exactly the same phenomena. There were a number of, how else can I describe them, but as magical moments on the ship when we were within the pack. We had some incredible sunsets. And I remember occasions where everybody was on the deck, just standing there in awe, looking at all these incredible washy colors just streaked around the horizon and reflecting off the off the ice. Uh, and it kind of reminds me of those moments where you, you walk into a great cathedral and suddenly there's this silence. Or if you talk, you talk in whispers. It was a bit like that. And in those moments, everybody, you know, you can't help it. You feel kind of squidgy inside. You think of family and you think of things like that in awe, looking at all these moments like that. And because of the ice crystals in the air, which we cannot see, there was a lot of very magical sun effects. And I do remember several occasions where we had this huge pillar of blazing light, which passed vertically from the ice horizon through the sun, right up into the heavens, just this burning pillar of orange, yellow colors. We call them parahelions. And they were described by Shackleton's diarists many times, in fact. And they had no idea what they looked at. And they were as, as in awe as we all were. If you've never seen a perihelion, as I have not, you can check out our Facebook page. We'll be posting a picture of one there. And Mensenbaum witnessed other phenomenal natural wonders. So, you know, you have this, it's, it's refraction is what I'm talking about from a scientific point of view, where things on the horizon and within the sky just become like something out of a kaleidoscope. Um, believe it or not, things like that are below the horizon get pulled upwards above the horizon. You shouldn't be able to see them because they are on the other side of the horizon. And things like icebergs appear upside down in refraction. It's, it's a very, very strange phenomenon. As I think back now on that incredible championship season we had this time last year, these are the moments I, I think of. I'm Eric Schultzka, and this is Constant Wonder. We're speaking with Menson Bound a distinguished marine archaeologist from Oxford University who last year discovered the resting place of Ernest Shackleton's ship, Endurance. Bound has described his notion of mind touch, and we've also brushed up against uncanny circumstances, specific experiences and observations that seem to mirror what Shackleton's crew saw and felt and thought. Some of these center on similar frustrations that both crews experience, and some of them on similar wonders that they experience in spite of the frustrations. Those sublime displays of icy polar sunlight reported by both crews a century ago and in 2022, these constituted a dangerous beauty. It's stunning, but it's also fraught with peril. They also described the sunsets, in particular the effects of refraction. And the reason in particular why they mentioned the refraction was because it made it impossible to use the sextant on those days. Because if you use a sextant, you're measuring the angle between the lower part or what we call the lower limb of the sun and the horizon. But if your horizon is buried in these kaleidoscopes of false 
dancing lights and strange upside down images. And there's no way you can tell what the horizon is and therefore you cannot get a snap on the sun at all. So yeah, it was rather strange. And I was always going back to the diarists at every moment, just living what they were living. As they were in the pack, so were we. And it did give wonderful, enriching insights. And these were moments where you felt you really knew those diarists as, as living, breathing people. So here was this brief false summer, brilliant weather before the winter closes in. Shackleton's men had experienced almost the same thing 107 years ago. Now Menson Bound and his team were reliving that same moment with a growing sense of resignation about their project. This sense of resignation combined with a desire to savor the moment before turning back led to one of the great paradoxes of this voyage. The two men most responsible for making it happen, John Shears and Menson Bound, were wandering off on the ice when the endurance was finally found. Believe it or not, myself and a friend of mine called John Shears, we were not on the ship at the moment of discovery because the weather was so beautiful. He and I had been talking for several days that if we got a chance, we'd get out on the ice together. And that morning when I opened my curtain, I, the ship was locked within a, a, in a giant ice flow and about two kilometers away, there was this iceberg just standing there right in front of my, my starboard side window. And so we decided we'd go for it. So about some soon after three in the afternoon, we layered up and we got lowered on the ice and we set off for the iceberg. And it would have been about, I don't know, half an hour after we got onto the ice that, um, that they found the wreck. Bound says, we found the wreck, but it was really the sonar team remotely operating submersibles from the icebreaker that found endurance. And for some hours after, Shears and Bound had no idea that their quest was complete. In fact, by some fluke, they had changed channels on their radios so they couldn't even be reached by the sonar team. So it turned out that Menson Bound himself had to reconstruct the moment of discovery vicariously. He's been asked about this many times, and he says it never bothered him. He's emphatic that he was so overwhelmed by the success of the team that he didn't even think twice about being out of contact at the pivotal moment. Here he is describing what happened to the crew while he was out on the ice. Just after four in the afternoon, an image appeared on the sonar screen, which was clearly man-made. And the only man-made object in, in the central Weddell, Weddell Sea is, of course, the endurance. So there was not really much doubt about what she was. We had a number of sonar, sonar experts on board. There was a guy called Francois. He used to be at the French Navy. He was an old Cold War submarine chaser. And he's one of the top four sonar experts in the world. And so they called over Francois and he took one look at it and he said, Satel, it's her. And uh, that was it. They went down low to about 25 meters for a high frequency, high resolution pass over the ship. And from that, they got this beautiful delineated image of the endurance from above. All this time, Menson Bound and John Shears, the two leaders of the expedition, were out on the ice, unaware of the excitement. And then... When I got back on board with John, he and I started uh, started to take off our polar kit. And I don't know about John, but I was absolutely frozen. All I could think about was getting to a heater and getting some warm fluid in me. And this young lad from the bridge, a cadet, suddenly appeared at my shoulder. And he said to me, Captain Bengo asked me to convey his respects and to say that your presence is required on the bridge immediately. And at that moment, the tannoy system on the ship just crackled to life. And it was shears and bound, bound and shears, to the bridge immediately, to the bridge immediately. And John and I looked at each other and we had no idea what was going on. But, you know, we'd never been spoken to like that before in our lives. We realized something major had happened and we started dashing for the bridge. And I had this terrible feeling that maybe we'd lost the vehicle because that's what happened three years before in the first search. And when you lose 10 million pounds worth of kit, I mean, it really is a terrible, terrible moment. But then as we're heading the bridge, I happened to catch at the corner of my eye, one of the French data analysts, and he's standing in the doorway and he's smiling. 
He's got this smile on his face like the front end of an old Hudson. And you know that if you just lost your main search vehicle, that you're not smiling. In fact, your face is absolutely ashen, but he was smiling. So at that moment, I'm thinking to myself, dare I think it? Dare I believe it? Could it be? Have we? And then we pour out onto, onto the bridge. We tumble out. And a guy called Nico Vincent, who's, who to my mind is the hero of the season, he's an amazing French underwater engineer. He was standing at the console with the captain, Knowledge Bango, and he strides up to me and he thrusts his iPhone into my face. And on the iPhone, there was this amazing image. And he says to John and I, he said, gents, let me introduce you to the endurance. And at that moment, everything just exploded in this uh, sunburst of just pure euphoria, the like of which I've never known in, in my life before. A good friend of mine called Freddie Ligthel, he was the one in charge of the bridge at that moment. And he was in his whites and his epaulettes, and he came across to me. He extended his right hand, and I met it with mine, we shook hands, and he said to me, and somebody caught this on a phone, he said, Menson, the quest is over, how do you feel? And I said to him, Freddie, I feel the, the breath of Shackleton himself on the back of my, on the back of my neck. As I listen to Menson Bound, I picture time entirely dissolving. That's what mind touch feels like to me as I listen to him. It's November 21st, 1915, and the endurance has been gripped by the ice. Now it's plunging through the water. It hits the dark bottom of the Weddell Sea. At the moment she hits, the moment the mud from that impact settles, a saber-tooth submersible from 2022 is waiting for her with its sonar pinging, and there's no gap in time or space at all. It's seamless. So we're on the bridge, and I've seen the high-frequency image that the guys acquired when we were out on the ice. And it was one of those moments where time really does stand still. I mean, time, what is it? There's archaeological time, there's, uh, you know, there's time in space, and there's time on my wrist. But at that moment, you just kind of caught up in this big wave of something. I, I'm looking at the image of the ship, and it's absolutely perfect. And the thing was, when we launched this expedition, and I made four predictions. I said that she'd be upright. I said that she'd be proud of the seabed. I said that she would be really well preserved. And I said that she'd be pretty much, and here I was going out on the limb a wee bit, but I said that she'd be pretty much three-dimensionally intact. And that is what we were looking at. She was just unbelievable. I mean, I've been in deep water archaeology for years now. I've been an archaeologist all my life. I've probably seen more deep water wooden ships than probably anybody else living. Uh, I think I can probably say that and get away with it. But never have I seen one as intact, as bold and as beautiful as the endurance of that moment. And then, of course, the next step is we've got to secure the data. So we go down and we do all the laser surveys of it. And then the next dive is the one which I just, I can't wait for. It's what we call the archeological inspection dive. It's when we actually go down and look at the ship in real time through cameras. And so we're going along the seabed, we're approaching the wreck and all we can see is just shadows and blackness and the lights sort of illuminating the seabed immediately before us. But then as we elevate the cameras, the next thing we see is the back of the ship and arced across the stern of the ship in nine letters is the word endurance picked out in capital letters in raised metal and beneath the name of the ship endurance is the five pointed star uh, the Polaris star, the North Star, after which the ship was originally named by her Norwegian makers, the Polaris. And I'm looking at this and I'm just, you know, the hairs in the back of my neck are just up on end. And then it gets better. We come up and we go over the taffrail. And I'm looking at the ship's wheel, the most emblematic part of, of, of a ship. It's the wheel, right? And I'm looking at it. It's an absolute perfect state of preservation. I could even see what we call the, the king spoke, the main spoke on the wheel. I just can't explain what you feel. As, as an archaeologist, you're supposed to be able to exercise a certain amount of, um, let's say, professional detachment between you 
and the object of your study. But at that moment, <laughs> forget it. I'm just excited as a little kid and as everybody else on the ship was at that time. We've heard a lot about these parallels, instances of very similar physical, sensory, or emotional experiences between the crews in the 100 years ago and today. For Mensum Bound and one of his close friends, that day of discovery, March 5th, ended with a moment that seemed to forge those kinds of human connections in all directions. Between Shackleton's men in this expedition, between two colleagues in the moment, and then looking forward to future generations. The day we found the wreck, the whole thing was teamwork. But naturally, within the team, you have people you feel closer to than others. And there was a guy on board called Chad, a very, very dear friend of mine from Louisiana. He and I had been on all sorts of missions together all around the world. We're very different guys from very different backgrounds. Chad is a deep water technologist. I'm an archaeologist. He's from the States. I'm from, the, from England or from the Falklands. But somehow or another, we, we just really got on well. So the evening after we found the wreck, we'd been down the back deck together. And then somebody appeared in the back deck reminding us that if we didn't get our tails, you know, down to the mess very quickly, there'd be no food there until breakfast the next morning. So he and I raced off together down to the mess because the excitement of the day, we'd, we'd literally forgotten to eat. You know, the last time we'd eaten was at breakfast and somewhere other we just were not hungry, but we didn't want to go the night without food. So we dashed down to the mess together and we start stealing all the menus because it had the date on the menu. We just suddenly realized these menus were significant. And then we sat down together to eat. And then Chad said to me, damn it, Manson, I got to get me some grandchildren. <laughs> and I sort of looked at him thinking, what's going on in Chad's head? And he said, you know, the only point of having grandchildren is so you can tell stories to them about what you did, you know, years before. And I got that. And it was funny, but one of the diarists, one of the uh, doctors on Shackleton's excavation, a man called Maitland, he kept a diary. And he talked about, you know, when he got older, he talked about sitting beside a fireplace in a pub. He talked about talking to his grandchildren and telling him about the grand epic of how he'd been with Shackleton and how they'd hopefully all survived. So for me, that is another mind touch moment. There's no physical artifact, but it is again striking that the two men who shared such related adventures over the same frozen waters of the Weddell Sea, 107 years apart, had the same impulse to share their experiences with grandchildren. It may seem like a small thing, but is it? So it, it was kind of one of those really, really special moments, which I'm just so grateful I shared that moment with him. There were a lot of very, very special moments that day, but that was kind of like a little, I don't know, it's like an amen cadence to the day. At the end of a hymn, you got that little bit where Avery sings amen. It was, it was just like that. Shackleton was buried on the... 5th of March, 1922, and we found his wreck on the 5th of March, 2022, exactly 100 years to the day after he was buried. Shackleton died at South Georgia and was buried there. And so we went to South Georgia, and then we had a ceremony at Shackleton's graveside over which I officiated, and I called on Captain Knowledge Bengo to talk first. I had no idea what he was going to say. And it was kind of a really special moment. And I remember Knowledge suddenly started addressing Shackleton as one ship's captain to another. And his opening words were, Boss, I've come to tell you that we've found your baby. And I look up and <laughs> it was a, a friend, a lady standing just in front of me about 10 meters away, and she was blubbering like a baby. And soon after that, everybody was there with wet eyes. We couldn't help ourselves. Thanks for joining with us on Constant Wonder. Given that we've devoted this hour to stories of important searches, I hope you'll forgive me for another mention of our own aim. Our podcast is also a journey, a quest, to find awe and wonder in nature and human nature, in worlds vast and small. It's a search for all that moves us. Thanks to Mensum Bound for being our guest. His new book is titled 
the ship beneath the ice, the discovery of Shackleton's endurance. Today's episode was produced with support from Mamie Teeples and Marcus Smith with sound design by Kira Van Hoven. I'm Eric Schultzka. Constant Wonder is a production of BYU Radio. 